Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to other people about their stories with VEDS or Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Staying Connected. This is your host, Katie, and before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in these podcasts are those of the individuals involved and do not represent the opinions of the Marfan Foundation. The Marfan Foundation is not responsible for and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in them, nor does the information constitute medical or other professional advice or services. This show is not produced by or affiliated with the Marfan Foundation or the VEDS movement. In our last episode, we talked to Sarah Fulop, who was diagnosed with VEDS in 2020 after her sister passed away from complications after pregnancy. In today's episode, we're going to touch base with a prior guest, Jeremiah Taze, who was on the podcast back in 2019. He's going to share his experience and insights over the last three years, as well as his experience with a bowel perforation that occurred in November 2021. Before we go over to the interview, if you want to support this show, consider joining my Patreon. For a few dollars a month, you can make sure this show continues to reach people around the world with real-life stories about beds. You can join the Patreon at patreon.com slash translucent1, and you can also support the show by sharing this podcast with people you know to help us raise awareness of beds around the world together. Thank you so much for your support, and a huge thanks to my current patrons who have already been supporting the show. My top-tier patrons are included in the episode show notes. All right, let's go to the interview. Hey, Jeremiah, welcome back to the podcast. It's been like three years since we did our interview back in 2019, and I'm so excited to have you back. Welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie, for having me again. Uh, it's been an interesting uh, time since the last, you know, <laughs> I guess three years. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about that. So you want to introduce yourself to people who don't know you yet? Yeah, yeah, sure. So my, my name is uh, Jeremiah. Um, I live in uh, Austin, Texas. Um I've got, uh, I'm affected with VEDS and I've got two, uh, two little boys, uh, 12 and nine, um, who are both affected with VEDS as well too. Um, been part of the community for some time now and also invested in some of the other, uh, the VEDS movement and stuff. So do some work with them. Cool. Well, I'm so excited to have this discussion because I feel like, you know, I went back and looked at, listened to the episode that we did back in 2019. And I think that we were, um, in Nashville maybe for the VEDS collaborative meeting, and, or we were in Houston, like, I don't know which one, because we got together a couple times in 2019, but we were so giggly and just happy. And I, like, did you go back and listen to it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was actually Nashville uh, where we did it. I remember uh, sitting in that back little room and it's fun. It was totally just uh, like spur of the moment. I think it was last minute thing. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I, I, I think personally me, I'm, I'm just a, I, I try to be happy go lucky person. I like to joke. I don't take myself too seriously, you know, and, and laugh about dumb things or whatever. So yeah, it was, it was a great time. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, it really was. And it was such an interesting moment in time to look back on for, for me. Cause it was, so that would be August, 2019. So it was before the VEDS movement. We were at the VEDS collaborative meeting. We were talking about designing a clinical trial. There was mice data that was coming out that has now, kind of come full circle. Do you want to talk about that at all? Like, how does it feel for you? Like, what's the difference for you between the last three years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, man, three years ago, things have dramatically changed in our community. Uh, we've got like, I think two trials that are, that one of them is kicked off and one of them is about to kick off. Um, I think at the time, yeah, just like we, we were all just new, just trying to figure out what, you know, what VEDS is and, you know, what, 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 you know, what these doctors are studying and, and trying to trying to do for our community. And and so, yeah, no, it was, it's really interesting to hear that scientific information. I mean, even if I personally, or maybe you, or a lot of people didn't really totally get all the science behind it, but it's still, uh, still great to hear all that information. Yeah. And I think that that was the first time that the mouse data was presented and it's the same, like that was the origin point, I think, for what has now come to be this upcoming ENSA store and trial. Yeah. Such an exciting thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It really is exciting. Yeah. We're we're super excited to have something that potentially could change, you know, 
the course events, you know, and, and just might have some major impact and give us a better quality of life, you know, and maybe a longer life, right? right. So. Yeah. And so when we talked back then, and I'm not going to have you redo like your diagnosis and stuff, like I think that has been recorded. So anybody who's not familiar with your story, I encourage you to go and listen to our first interview back in 2019. If there's room in this episode today, I'll be putting it at the end of this episode so you don't have to go dig up, dig for it or anything like that. Um, but back then, you know, you were describing your history and you hadn't had a major life-threatening event. And I know both of us last year had life-threatening events. Do you want to talk about yours? Yeah. Um, so it's back in November, just started like kind of any day where I just you know, logged onto my computer for work and uh, it's kind of having like a, just some subtle pain in my, my abdomen is, thought it was just, you know, whatever, something, you know, just kind of normal things. You get pain from time to time. And so it's low enough, sure enough, as the day kind of progressed, that pain started to get a little bit more, um, a little bit more, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely more, more present or it's hurt, starting to hurt a lot more. And so I ended up like logging off and I, you know, my, my wife was kind of monitoring me and stuff throughout the day. And so, uh, Kind of just logged off and just kind of laid down in bed for a bit and uh, i think i had like a low-grade fever at that point in time and, uh, and so my wife was you know constantly you know, kind of checking on me periodically and um you know i was just really not feeling well at all and then it's probably about four or five o'clock i think you know in the evening and i just i just knew something was was off it just things were just different you know the feeling of it and so i ended up just telling her like i think we need to go to the to the, to the er and so we ended up going to to the ER here in um, you know Round Rock, and um, yeah, it was just uh, you know things kind of progressed from there. We were luckily able to get back pretty quickly, um, and uh, got got you know got a CAT scan, uh, and um, you yeah, know came back that um, they saw like a what's called like a Meckel's diverticulitis, mm-hmm. um, and so um, basically like what they what first kind of the first line of pass or the first line of defense I guess for something like that was. They started injecting me with like uh, antibiotics and stuff, and they said, you know, sometimes these things can kind of heal themselves. And so I think what we're going to do is we're going to start you on a course of antibiotics, um, and then we'll kind of see what goes from there. Um, so you know, I had doctors coming coming down and stuff, and and they were they were basically they were, they said we can admit you, and then you know we'll kind of monitor you here. Um, and um, so also they said like you know worst case scenario you know we've got to do surgery or whatever. And so at this time, like, we know, uh, we're already kind of communicating with with my primary doctors in Houston just to kind of, you know, see, get their input and get them kind of in the conversation. Um, and at this point, like I had already been, they were pumping me already for like pain meds and stuff like that. So I, I really hate pain meds. But uh, uh, yeah, so I was already feeling, you know, kind of out of it. And so lucky, you know, my, my wife was there um, advocating for me during that time. And uh yeah, the surgeon kind of came down and was kind of giving us, you know, some initial consultation. And um, immediately, we just knew something was was kind of off. Like we just like he was, as most doctors with beds, you know, you kind of run into some weird situation. Like um, they're just kind of arrogant, you know. And so we tried to explain beds to him, and uh, we even got like some a doc, one of our doctors to see if they if they if he could call them and consult with them. And um, it was really arrogant. Like he just like didn't want to even like really, um, really talk to them, but he ended up doing it after some time after us, you know, kind of pestering. Talking. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Maybe we, that's not the right word. Persevering. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we were pushing him very, very strongly. And so, um, so yeah. So in this situation, right. We're, we're you know, talking to the, the surgeon and, uh, we finally got him on the phone with, with our, our doctors that know vets. And, um, even after that, it just like, seemed like, he was off. He was being really rude to, to, to my wife and, um, and, re- and my wife stepped away, um, for, for a bit. And, um, he was like, kind of almost like, I, I remember this really, really vividly, but he was like, he was talking to me directly and he was like, almost like, like trying to sell me, like, you know, I, I'll do the surgery. I can do it. You're going to be okay. Whatever. It was really just like kind of awkward, honestly. And, yeah. and so, um, what was the surgery that he wanted to do? Basically, yeah. So they were going to have to remove that Meckel's. Uh, di- it's like a, I don't know if you know what Meckel's diverticulitum is. I, I don't, I kind of know a little bit now from after the fact, but basically what it is, it's like tissue um, whenever you're born, like um, 
part usually on a normal person like that, that tissue it's basically like the umbilical cord it's supposed to like go back and kind of like seed back into your intestines mm -hmm. or but in certain um, cases i think it, it just doesn't do that and so you still have like this pouch that sits there so i guess things can get like trapped in there and in okay. my case that's what they were seeing something was was there um and it was inflamed or whatever and so um yeah, you know, my, my wife, Ra uh, Rachel, came back from from outside um, and we just kind of both looked at each other and we we're like, I don't know what we're going to do. You know, we're, we're like in this situation and we've always had this plan, you know, course of action. What are what are we going to do? You know, and right. something happens. And. Um, yeah, uh, part of us were like, I think we're OK. We can probably stick around here and we'll be OK. And then um, I think, I think after you know, kind of just talking back and forth. We were like, we get, we got to figure out how to get, get to Houston. I, I just, we just knew something was, was different, right. Something was really off. And so um, what we ended up saying was like, uh, we want to be transferred to Houston um, to a higher level of care, which we actually found out you can do. And so that's really important, you know, uh, but definitely want to emphasize that for, for, you know, every, anybody that's listening to this, you know, if you're in a, in a hospital somewhere and you just feel like, you know, that's not the right place for you, you know, you can be transferred for a you know, higher level of care um, into an actual hospital that, you know, that is actually can, can you know, I would say better, but but it just can treat your, your situation more, more, more better, I guess, or whatever. So like a, like a higher level trauma center or yeah. tertiary care center or a university hospital, like something exactly. that is different than the one that you're sitting exactly. at, right? Exactly. Yeah. Cause this wasn't, I think it was like a level three trauma center. So not really a great place that you want to be at. Right. And so as soon as we said that, like they wheeled us back into a, like a holding room and, and that's when things, the ball started really getting rolling. And so, um, yeah, so it was probably a couple hours, you know, of, it was already like almost getting past like midnight or whatever at this time. So we're both really exhausted at this point, you know, just battling, <laughs> battling the doctors, you know, trying to figure out what the right call is, um, you know, in this situation. And so uh, sure enough, it's about 1230, you know, past, you know, midnight, whatever, past midnight. And, uh, the, you know, paramedics show up and they start getting me ready to, to be transported um, out and, uh yeah, so I got wheeled out, you know, middle of the night. It's definitely not the best situation. And you know, my, my wife, uh, you know, wheeled out with me. And, um, you know, we were like, you know, probably should wait because she she didn't. It was like a three hour drive and it was already, you know, really late at night and she was tired. I didn't want her to like, you know, fall asleep while driving or something. And um, so she didn't follow. She ended up going home and kind of getting, you know, going home to the kids to kind of get them ready for for tomorrow to get, you know, to come up to Houston. And so, yeah, that was an interesting ride to uh, to Houston. So, yeah, if you've ever been transported in a in an ambulance, it's a pretty rocky ride in the back, fortunately. And especially with the situation going on, it was it exacerbated the pain. So, it, so, anyways, yeah, throughout the ride, um, kicked off. You know, three hours past midnight, um, we're rolling through uh, like two ninety back. You know, dark. It's really dark out there and stuff. And uh, probably like 30 minutes into the ride, like I just um, started feeling like overwhelming sense of nauseousness just overcame me. And I was like, just spinning. And um, like, um, you know, the, the paramedic that was back there with me, I was just like, I, I'm not feeling good at all. Um, you know, I, I think like I'm going to like vomit. And so I was looking for a bag. Right. And, um, and the only the last thing I remember is I just like completely just, I just blacked out. And, um, I woke up probably like maybe, you know, a few hours later or something kind of came to and I was uh, noticed there's another IV in my arm. And like he was just kind of the paramedic was just kind of like shocked, a little bit kind of like shocked, really. He was just like, I was like, what happened? Where am I at? And he's like, yeah, you're, you're you just tank, basically your vitals just tank, you know, and um, and uh, yeah, just basically lost consciousness, I guess, for for a bit of time. And then. um. Happened again, probably about 20 minutes later, the same thing, this overwhelming sense of nauseousness, boom, blacked out. And the next thing I realized, like, we're already kind of like in Houston, uh, trying to find um, the, the ambulance bay for, for us to get, you know, um, so they can drop me off or whatever. Came to for a bit and you know, was having a bit of a conversation with the paramedic and he was just like, you know, thank you. He was just like, I I'm really thankful that they sent me because they were looking, they were going to send to somebody to sit back here with you that probably wasn't a paramedic. And so, um, 
yeah, he's like, if, if that would have happened, they wouldn't have been able to administer like any, you know, kind of medications or things like that. So, so because he was there, he was able to basically revive your vitals. Basically. Yeah. Um, wow. and so, yeah, it's very fortunate. It's such a, such a lovely man. I, I still haven't been able to figure out who he is to this day. I really feel like I need to, you know, just, to, just to thank him and, and thank the other driver. Cause like they were, they were like sleeping, you know, and they, they probably, you know, they, transported somebody you know from one rock to houston in the middle of the night it's probably not a fun thing to do but um he was such a kind person and yeah I, i'm really thankful for for them for for being there and doing that for me uh anyway so i get you know get to houston memorial herman um and i i go to the er and get you know admitted and get back to a room and um yeah just uh that was kind of the you know the next steps um, they got me all, you know, set up or whatever with IVs and everything. So I had IVs sticking out everywhere. It seems painful after, oh. Um, and um, yeah, the next morning, you know, the, the doctors make their rounds, you know, early in the morning. And um, so um, I got to meet some of my team about six in the morning. And I'll never forget this, but I, I met the surgeon, you know, pretty much, you know, did the surgery. It's, I, I guess, saved my life, right? Um, he came in and um, he was just kind of like, you know, looking over me and whatnot. And um, he was just kind of trying to see where the pain was and what, what's, you know, kind of the severity of the situation, I guess. Um, and they had had scans. And so they, they heard, they, they saw the meckles or the meckle diverticulitum, but that's all that they knew, I guess, at the time. So um, I'll never forget this because it was really, really, really painful. <laughs> but uh, he did like this. Uh, he was like in my abdomen area and he did like this popping thing. And it was just the most excruciating pain ever. It was just like, and, and I'm somebody, I, I feel like I have a high pain tolerance. Like I, you know, I just, I, I, things like that really don't phase me too much, but I'll, I'll never forget that. <laughs> and so whenever he saw my eyes and saw me like gasp, like he was just like, I, this, this is an emergency. And so within the hour I'm sitting there, you know, I got a bunch of people coming in and out of my room and, and basically, you know, they put all these documents in front of you and, you know, you got to start signing your life away basically. And, 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 you know, my wife's not even there at the time. She's still back home in Austin. And, um, and like, yeah, she's, I, I, I was able to call her and talk to her. I was like, you know, they're, they're going to win me back pretty quickly here and you're probably not going to make it before that happens. And so, um, you know, just it's, uh, you know, tell the kids, I love them. You know, I love you. And, 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 you know, we'll see you. <laughs> and so there I am just, you know, side of my life away and uh yeah it was really a little stressful you know uh, for sure and um you know i got um so anyways yeah so within an hour i was you know being wheeled back to to an or and um kind of a surreal experience honestly if, you, if you've ever been if you've ever been rolled back into a, an er it's uh it's a little surreal you know mm -hmm. um so and what did they, so what kind of surgery did they end up doing? Yeah. So, uh, so initially they, they didn't know they were going to go in and do exploratory surgery, right. See what, what's going on. So that they, they were going to go in like laparoscopic, you know, less invasive. Um, it was like three keys or three keyholes or something kind of like what they would do for like gallbladder surgery or something. Mm -hmm. Just to check in cameras and stuff and see what they can find out in there. And, um, so, uh, yeah, I get wheeled back into the room. There's a table. You got like 20 people kind of standing around, all various, you know, nurses, technicians, anesthesiologists, doctors. And it's quite impressive because like they all they all know about your your situation, your case, and and just kind of thinking about you know, everybody's got to play a vital part in this whole ordeal. And you're kind of the star of the show, right? You're about to be in the middle of everything. And um, yeah, you know, from, from there, you know, just the standard, you know, they, they basically they tell you what's about to happen. And, um, and a anesthesiologist puts the little thing over your face and then you know, count back from 10 and then it's blacked out at that point. Yeah. Um, Thankfully. Right. Cause if you weren't, yeah, you pretty, weren't much. Good pretty much, pretty much. So, uh, yeah, from what I can remember, you know, you wake up in, in the recovery room and you're just very out of it, right. From the anesthesia and just pain meds, whatever. And so, um, what did they find? Yeah, so um, yeah, ended up uh, they ended up like I said they they went in and, and started the exploratory surgery and then they, they realized that it was much more severe, and so they ended up having to to open me all up basically a full you know um, uh, abdomen you know 
open up whatever mm-hmm. so what they found was that um that basically i had like um the part of my bowel had already like preparated and um uh, that tissue was already like pretty much like necrotic or dying basically at that point it was dead some of it and so they ended up having to um you know they do full surgery they ended up removing like 15 centimeters of my of my ileum um um, of course, like with any VEDS patient, there's always uh, a lot of bleeding, lost a lot of blood during the surgery. Um, and they ended up having to cut more of the of the actual ileum because of the, the um, a lot of the vessels were like just shredding apart and they were having a lot of problems trying to, you know, close things and, and stop, stop the bleeding. Uh, in particular, the mesenteric artery, which I think is like one of the major arteries that feeds like your, your whole bowel, your intestines or whatever. Um, they had a lot of issues trying to stop that from bleeding. Uh, so the surgery, you know, ended up uh, going like six hours or something like that, I believe. So, you know, much more longer surgery, um, uh, some complications with that. And then uh, another thing that I, I had heard afterwards was like um, that uh, it took a little time for me to come out of the anesthesia. Like they were having a problem. They were having some trouble trying to get me breathing again. So they had to intubate me and stuff um, uh, after surgery. Um, but yeah, one of the things uh, that was, I guess, a positive of the surgery was that um they were they got really i guess they were able to to remove the you know the, the part of the ileum that had turned bad or whatever septic or whatever and also uh, another thing i was dealing with, with that was septic right from bowel preparation and so um but they were able to get a really uh, good um when they went to reconnect it they got a real good um seal and so um um i was very fortunate lucky i didn't have to end up with a with an ileum i guess a vag or something whatever they call it an ileum right. like an ileostomy bag or, yeah um, they, they were able to, to get a good seal and they even tested it. Like, uh, there's some special dye that they can use. Um, and then they basically run it under, I guess, microscopes or something or scans, um, to, to tell that there was no leaks or whatever. So, uh, yeah, that's, I got really lucky in that part. And I know a lot of people with, with beds that have surgery like this, they always end up with, they end up with a bag or something in it, you know, that's yeah. definitely much more, uh, intense thing, I think in the long, you know, long-term recovery from that and just kind of dealing with with that aspect mm-hmm. um yeah so woke up in recovery um and uh yeah it was uh you know wheeled back to to the to the back to the room or whatever and um yeah that's so when i saw uh, rachel for the first time you know out of that and um yeah it's kind of that's kind of you know just kind of healing after that uh, the first night was really difficult like uh there was some complications and stuff they ended up having to give me um um, frozen fresh plasma or something, FFP, I guess is how they oh, say okay. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Cause like, uh, probably like, you know, sometime towards the night, I just wasn't feeling, feeling good at all. Um, and, and they did some labs or whatever, and I can't remember what they saw. Some, something to test to see, you know, what, what your blood looks like or whatever clotting factors mm-hmm. and stuff. And it was not, it was not really good. And so they ended up, you know, deciding that I had to get FFP, Another thing too that they noticed is potassium was really low um, because I guess when you lose so much blood, your body's just it's crazy. Oh, those potassium pills are so <laughs> gross. Did you I have think, to take the pills or did they? No, no. I think this is all intravenous, I believe. It was okay. all through, uh, through IV or whatever because I couldn't swallow anything at, you know, yeah. at the time. Um, but um, yeah, just I just remember all these bags looking up and there's just so much stuff on the hangers or whatever they call them. And, what did all of this feel like for you? Like emotionally, how was this experience? Ooh, I mean, I think initially, like when I was in the actual thing in the in the moment, right? Like I, I was just just wanted to get the heck out of there, right? As fast as you could. So you just try to like kind of block off the emotional aspect of it and just try to try to understand that this is what I this is the situation that I'm in right now. And uh, you know, just Try not to get too emotional. I, I don't think it's really affected me. Like as far as like I, I don't feel like I. It was definitely moments where I was definitely like I'm. I'm. I, I gotta I just. Uh, I gotta get out of here. You know, out of the situation. But um, you know, it's kind of the fight or flight mode, I guess. Right. You're just, yeah. You just want to get out of there. Um, I think you know now you know like it's been you know almost I guess ten months or whatever. Um, yeah, I. I I don't know. I'm a pretty positive person. I just kind of see it as something that happened part of my life. And, you know, you just figure out how to move forward, you know, don't, don't dwell upon, upon things, you know. Mm-hmm. Has it changed the way that you experience feds? 
Yeah, for certain. Um, I mean, like I had seen my kids go through things and, and obviously, you know, some of close friends, family, whatever, and in the community, you know, go through traumatic situations. And so I think when, it, until it happens to you, um, you really don't, I guess, grasp the severity or the possible outcomes of, of what vets can do. Um, and so, yeah, definitely. It's definitely made me, um, yeah, just more aware, uh, more cautious, I think, you know, that, you know, got to, got to be more careful, you know, with, with, with my life. Yeah. Let's talk about, so you mentioned that you had a plan going yeah. in, like before, you know, you had an emergency plan, basically you and Rachel did and that nothing really played out. Like it didn't play out the way that you had planned. Right. Um, yeah. speak to that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we've had this diagnosis, uh, just about eight years and stuff. So in that moment, like, you know, we'd always talked about, you know, we feel like we got a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. Um, I mean, really the plan always ends up like we got to figure out how to get to our doctors that, that understand, you know, what beds is. Um, yeah. I mean, like in that situation, like, you know, it's just like, you always tend to like kind of second guess yourself, I think. Um, and you know, you're like, I, I think maybe, maybe I'll be okay here. Right. I think, you know, I'm in, I'm in a hospital. Right. And these do these are doctors. Um, yeah, I, I think just, you know, one thing I'll say is like, if you, you know, everybody should have a plan for, for one, um, but stick to your gut. You know, I think a lot of it is, you know, something, you, if you can just sense that something is wrong, go with it. That, you know, that, that could, that could be the, the difference in, in, you know, life and death. That's really great advice. And that, you know, I've talked to other people this season in these interviews that have said similar things about like trusting your instincts and your gut. And sometimes you don't have a choice, right? But in your situation, like you had bad vibes from the surgeon, you didn't quite feel right about the whole thing. And, you know, you luckily had a paramedic in the ambulance with you, you know, so that you can make it to Houston. Um, but I think there is something to be said about trusting your gut for sure. Yeah, you know, trusting your gut, and also I think in, in my situation, I think it's a little bit of um, I don't know luck, faith. I don't know whatever you want to call it, right? Just you know, I got lucky. I don't know. Um, God is looking after me. If you're a religious person, I don't know. Um, but uh, like because of the thing is, is like one of the things that we didn't realize was when we got to Houston, um, and then all this stuff happened. Like we didn't realize that I, I, I had already perforated at that point, so I was already in sep septic, you know, turning septic. And so I, I think that if they would have found that on the scans in, in, in here in our other hospital here in Round Rock, I, I think they probably wouldn't have transported me because I probably wasn't stable enough to even be transported. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think a little bit of I'm kind of lucky that they didn't see that on the scans. So, you know, because I did end up in the right place that ultimately ended up you know saving my life. Um, yeah. And so. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So the, I think there's a little bit of luck in that, and, and also just us just knowing that we had to we had to stick with our plan and, and get get to where you know get to Houston. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you made it. Yeah, me too. It was great hugging you in in uh, Newport Beach in July at conference. Like it was. I think you know we both in the last couple of years, certainly with the pandemic and just how chaotic everything was. And then us both having life-threatening events, not like, I think it was in th within three or four weeks of each other. Yeah, like yeah. it just felt really good to see you friend. <laughs> Feelings mutual. I, I, yeah, you don't realize, you know, I guess how much these people, how much everybody that has this condition when you meet them, how much they mean to you. Like, I mean, it's just like an immediate, like, you know, they get it. Yeah. And I get it too. And, 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 you know, and that is really something that's powerful because like, you don't, you don't, you know, you live with this condition on day to day. And, uh, sometimes you feel like you're like, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. But sometimes you also feel like you, like you're the only one, right. Like in your, and, you know, and, and whenever you get to hang out with, with, with people that are living with this condition, um, family members, I'm going to call them family because that's really, yeah. what they are. um, 
whenever you get to talk to, you know, even when we do like support groups or whatever, and just see one another's faces and, and just talk about our, you know, what we're going through at that point in time, it's, you don't really realize how the mental aspect of, of that you also need that to, it's not just living in the physical aspect. There's this mental aspect with it and, you know, just being able to talk to people and, and, you know, you know just know that you're in a, you're in kind of in a safe space, I guess, you know, and I mean, I, I, you know, I share, I'm pretty open about the vets and pretty open with, with everybody that, that I know. And yeah, you know, it's just, I think for me, that's being open is, is kind of my, my way to express myself and to also not let things like bother me or bog me down. Yeah, I, I completely understand that. So what is advice that you would give to somebody who's just new to this diagnosis or new to the community? Yeah. I mean, you know, thinking about three years ago and where we were, where we were at, you know, I mean, there's so much, so many things now, um, you know, get involved, you know, as, as soon as, I mean, I, I don't think there's really much different than I said in the, in the previous podcast, but like, you know, really you, you, you've got to be your, your own advocate. You've got to realize that nobody's going to, to kind of hold your hand in this whole thing. And so, um, you know, getting involved in the, in, in the support groups, there's some amazing support groups and we meet like on a monthly basis, which is really just a wonderful time to just kind of, it's a mini reunion every time we join those things. <laughs> um, yeah, just getting involved, you know, the VEDS movement, just educate yourself. There's so many wonderful resources that they're at your disposal there. Um, finding your hospitals, getting your building up your care team. I mean, there's really, there's really no rocket. There's, I mean, it's not rocket science, but I, I will say there's definitely, it requires work. It definitely, it's, it's a lot of work. And unfortunately what you have to understand is living with this life-threatening condition is that it's going to be work. Um, not only are, are you, you know, living the day to day and you have struggles in a day to day, but you know, um, it's, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're, you know, you've got to be your own advocate. And it does feel like now versus back in 2019, you know, and some, there had been some change in 2019 from when I was diagnosed in 2017 already, but it does feel like there are more resources to help in all of that now than there was before. So it's yeah. like, it's hard and it's yeah. frustrating. It, to me, it feels less frustrating than it did even three years yeah. ago. And I, I hope that that makes a difference for three years from now. Right. I think so. I mean, hopefully three years from now, you know, it'll be even better. Right. Like I think, you know, where we're at today, um, just taking advantage of what we have right now can definitely, you know, save your life. I think, um, I'll say one thing, um, the, the one, one of the wonderful things that we've had luck with, unfortunately I, I've heard of some people that haven't had luck with it, but, um, but the, the there's that little, uh, vets, uh, emergency, emergency card. And, um, you've been fortunate enough that whenever we present that, you know, at, at the ER, you know, you know, um, that, that usually gets us, gets us back pretty quickly. Um, I like to think it's a card, but also I'm, I'm really lucky. I've got my wife. I mean, Rachel is an amazing, amazing advocate. You know, she, uh, she's a firecracker, you know, she's, when she's in that situation. She really shines. And, um, yeah, for some reason, she's got like this amazing gift that when she speaks, people kind of listen to her. And, um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm as a husband living with this condition, I'm, I'm really lucky to have an amazing advocate and yeah, uh, you know, that's super lucky. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jeremiah, for coming back on and sharing your experience since 2019. Yeah. Thank you so much, Katie. Appreciate it. Thank you everyone for listening in today and thank you Jeremiah for coming back onto the show to share your experience over the last few years. In the beginning of this episode, I mentioned the prior interview with Jeremiah back in 2019. I decided to link this in the episode show notes so you can find it really easily. If you're interested in hearing his story of his diagnosis and his family's diagnosis, you can find it there in the episode show notes. On the next episode on October 15th, we'll talk to Christy Gann who was diagnosed after her son Hunter passed away last year after an aortic dissection. 
Don't forget to subscribe to the Staying Connected podcast on your podcast player so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you like this show, I hope you will consider sharing it with your friends on social media to help us raise awareness of vets together. You can also support the production of this podcast by joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash translucent1. Thank you so much, and I will see you soon.